All right. Can uh, can you confirm that you hear me, someone? One more time. Thank you. Yes. Okay, great. So we start. Uh, okay, we can start by uh, just presenting quickly the solution to homework three. So this is a file. As usual, I will upload this after the lecture uh, to the folder of the homework file. So you can go and check it yourself, and we can see what we are doing here. This is a uh, so there's a little bit more than what the homework asks. So we have here, I have here a phonetic interaction strength, which essentially creating an interactive, uh, like attractive force between particles. So they kind of pull each other, depending on this strength. And you can also put this in the opposite side. They kind of push each other away. But for the sake of homework three, you don't need to change this at all. So you can play with the parameters here. You can change the number of particles. You will have more particles. You can have less particles. You can do whatever you want to do. And then you can change, for example, the rotational diffusion strength. If you increase it, you see that particles are going around much more randomly. And if you set it to zero, you see that they go pretty much on a straight line unless they hit, they hit each other and kind of get blocked by each other. Okay, I put it back to some random values. And then this is the aligning strength, the aligning interaction that we have in the homework. You will see that if you increase it, they're gonna form clusters. And if, if there is no interaction, they will go back to just moving uh, active Brownian motion as they're supposed to do. And you can, when the interaction strength is high, you will see that if there are no, uh, there is no rotational diffusion, which means the noise is very low, they will uh, form much more stable clusters. And if the noise is high, you will see that the cluster formation is not really happening as it was in the case of lower rotational diffusion. So any questions about this? I cannot see the chat here. Let me open the chat also here so I can see. Yes, great. So here we can check the implementation. So again, here there is a lot of part of the code that is just to generate some this uh, canvas environment and generate these controls that I'm using. And uh, you can see that I am initiating. So I have essentially uh, three arrays that I use that is necessary for me, x, y, and phi. So what I have is x position of the particles. So if I have n particles, small n, uh, I need to generate n locations for x, n locations for y, and n random initial orientation for each one of them. So this is all the information I actually need to, to run the simulation so that I don't really need to keep any other information. So I have three by n amount of uh, numbers of information. And then I generate uh, an empty array in the beginning for the torque acting on each particle and forces along x and y. And then I go into the simulation in the beginning. Uh, so I get the parameters and I have here two if cases just in case this is only to this is only in case I change this slider here in the number of particles. So I kind of uh, vanish some particles if I decrease the number here, or I add some new particles in the commas if I increase the number. That these are not some functions you need to worry about. This real simulation is going on here. So you can see that I apply the velocity along x, random motion along x, apply the uh, uh, periodic boundary conditions. And here, this is the phoretic interactions that you actually don't have in the homework. And the change of angle over time is there is a, a random rotational diffusion part and there is a torque acting on it, which is going to be calculated later. And then for each particle, I check what is the distances of all the other particles and the angles, kind of the direction of the, each particle. And then I set kind of a limit and then if, uh, Okay, this is for clustering. Uh, so to calculate what color they will have, but this is not essential to the homework again. Here I, I set an interaction distance. I put it to five times the radius. And then I make sure that the particle doesn't interact with itself. So this gives me a true false array of 
each particle, uh, what other particles it's going to interact with. And then I calculate the forces and the torque acting on the particle according to this uh, interactive array, which is true false array. I use it for indexing with the other particles. And these are the formula that we put in the homework file. And then here I apply the, the volume exclusion. So I do it between every two particles. But of course, if I split two particles, if it's crowded, it can then overlap with a third particle, which we don't want to happen. So in that case, I do it three times just to make sure that uh, uh, everything goes smooth. And uh, actually, you can increase this number if you see some problems in the overlapping of the particles. But so far, from what I can see in the simulation, I can increase this, like even the foretic interactions I can increase. It looks like they're not, uh, it looks like the overlap exclusion works fine unless there is a very crowded you can see that here there is a little bit of overlap so they act like a little bit of softer particles so they can uh, contract a little bit but uh, if you want to make it work better you can always increase this number so that you do it more and more times of course it's going to be computationally less efficient is there any questions about this All right, so I will upload this to homework folder and I recommend, especially those of you who struggled with this homework to check this out, try to understand how it works. All right, let's go to the lecture. So this lecture, we will talk mostly about active Brownian motion in complex and crowded, crowded environments. And uh, it is having, almost the same title as the as the referenced article here and most of the content will be closely related to this article so i highly recommend you have a look at it if you're interested in any of the concepts can you verify that you can see my presentation screen now in the chat someone please yes great so let's begin so this is an outline so first we will have a look at the introduction of active brownian motion this you have seen before in a previous lecture brownian motion so it will be shorter and we will talk about some experimental realizations and how people naturally and artificially create active particles in, in liquid environments. And uh, we, will we will see how this results in a breakdown on equilibrium statistics when particles are active in an environment. And we will see some collective behavior of these active particles, like the, in the case of our homework three. And we will see some sort of uh, advanced scientific techniques where people use to sort and filter kind of active particles in, in uh, microscopic environments. Okay, so we can start with the first one. So if you have a Brownian particle in a liquid environment, what will happen is that this particle will have a random motion along X and Y. So each time step, it will have a random displacement along X and along Y. The displacement will be Gaussian distributed and the amplitude of the displacement will be proportional to the square root of the translational diffusion coefficient. So this is uh, how we simulate regular Brownian motion, or actually how we model this is the equation of motion. Uh, this is Langevin equation essentially for a free particle in a liquid environment. What happens if, a, if our particle has a velocity along a certain direction? So it's a, if it's a swimmer particle, it means that it will uh, the the displacement along x will be also will also have a, a component that is uh, proportional to its velocity and the uh, cosine of the orientation and the displacement along y will have an extra component that is the velocity times the sine of phi so it will go along uh, these directions according to its velocity and orientation also we will have a have a third equation that defines the evolution of the uh, orientation of the particle in, in which the, the, the direction that the particle is propelling itself. So this uh, it can be uh, fast or slow depending on the diffusion, rotational diffusion coefficient that defined as dr here. So the for, more, for, for regular Brownian particles, spherical particles in the, the coefficients scale with the translational diffusion coefficient scales with 
the temperature divided by the radius of the particle, whereas the rotational diffusion coefficient scales with the temperature divided by the cube of the ra ra radius of the particle. So as the particles get smaller, they diffuse faster in a liquid environment. That's why when you have a look at under microscopy, if you have a look at a particle, for example, that is 50 microns, that is almost visible with, with naked eye, you may not be able to see its motion because its motion compared to its size uh, over time is very slow. So diffusion for that particle will not be so fast. However, if you, have, if you can visualize a microscopic particle in an environment that is much smaller, you will see that it's moving much faster and also it's reorienting itself, the rotational diffusion. The, let's say the, the rate in which the particle changes its orientation will be much faster. And here you can see some sort of uh, sample simulations where the particle is moving. And these are all, these are all different uh, uh, realizations of the same simulation. So you can see that the direction can be uh, actually, okay, this is uh, kind of the same simulation, but particle started with different initially randomized direction. So you can see that it has some sort of rotational diffusion that takes changes direction uh, continuously, and it has a constant swimming velocity plus a regular Brownian motion. But what can happen is that just like swimmer particles that have a constant propulsion, so they propel themselves in one direction over time, there might be Brownian particles that are active and also chiral, which means that these particles don't tend to swim on a straight line, they tend to uh, also rotate in one direction uh, more often than the other. So they kind of apply not only a force on themselves, but also they apply a torque on, on their own axis. So an example can be like a, a bacteria with flagella, or an example can also be a particle that propels itself that is asymmetric, Due to its asymmetry, there is a torque acting on the particle from the liquid response. And this will create a, uh, a additional term in the equation of motion of the, of the orientation of the particle, that is omega. So just like the, the particle of positions that were changing with the velocity, the particle's orientation will change linearly in addition to the rotational diffusion, it will change linearly with this uh, rotational velocity omega that the particle is acting on itself. Is it clear so far? Any questions? All right, we can move on. Okay, let's see now uh, what happens when we have this kind of motion. Uh, we want to, let's say we want to simulate this. Importantly, we, we need to, so that, okay, here maybe we need to understand how we can simulate. So in order to simulate this equation, we need to put, convert this into different equations. So instead of dx divided by dt, I need to use a notation delta x divided by delta t. In this case, what will happen is that we need these kind of uh, difference equations in order to simulate it. We don't use differential equations, but we use difference equations for simulation. So what will happen in this case is that uh, I calculate the orientation, x and y positions of the particle for each next step. So the important thing is that if I didn't have these uh, random uh, terms, the, this part would be very clear. The, the particle's position at i plus one will be x i plus the velocity along x, which is velocity times the cosine phi i, the, the orientation at, at time step i times delta t. Plus, we need to add a random term that is responsible for the diffusion. However, you can notice that here, wxi is the random number I generate for the related to the particles diffusion along x at i time step. This has a mean zero and variance one. So it's essentially in MATLAB or Python, notation or syntax, this is what we call round n, the, the function that we call. 
here what is interesting is that i i don't need to multiply this by the the, the amount of time step delta t but i put it uh, uh, in the square root. So this is the displacement along one direction due to diffusion is proportional not to not to delta t but to the square root of delta t. This is simply because if you add two if you add two random numbers on top of each other, if you have two Gaussian distributed random numbers with uh, mean zero and variance one, their total variance will be two. So not that their mean or their standard deviation will add up it's their variance that will add up onto each other. So this is one thing that you need to be careful about if you are changing delta t in a simulation where you simulate Brownian motion or any motion for that matter related to diffusion or random walks. Here you can see that these random numbers we create for each time step, we, we kind of uh, uh, normalize them by dividing them to the square root of delta t. That is why the mean square displacement is going to be changing. If we have, if we don't have any velocity, the displacement will be proportional to the square root of delta t, and mean square displacement will be proportional to delta t. So this is what we see here. So we have here four different particles. Importantly, we can have a look at uh, the one that is not moving. The, the particle that has no velocity here and the particles that have velocity here. So if we check the uh, mean square displacement here, the most important thing for the, for the particle with no velocity is that its mean square displacement is going increasing linearly with time because on log log scale, its slope is one, which means that it's going, it's increasing linearly in time. And if a particle is, going on a, uh, with, a, with a constant swimming velocity, we can figure from this equation here actually, is that its displacement will be proportional to delta t. So we expect its mean squared is its square displacement to be proportional to delta t squared, in which case the slope in this plot, I, I expect it to be uh, having a, in the, in the log log plot of mean square displacement versus time, I expect it to be having a slope of two for a, for a particle that is moving with a constant velocity. So that is why all of these particles motions actually lie in the whole regime between a, a slope of two and between a slope of one. And here you can see that they all start with kind of the same kind of behavior, but since the particles that have velocity have a larger mean square displacement over time, they have a higher slope as well because they kind of have a persistent motion that allows for a slope that is higher than one. This kind of motion is characterized as super diffusive behavior. So the regular diffusion is defined as a particle that is moving randomly in each direction, like a Brownian particle. And it, a important characterization for a regular diffusion is that it is slope uh, on a log log plot of mean square displacement versus time is one. So it's changing linearly. Mean square displacement is increasing linearly with time. And of course, if our particles have a velocity that are able to propel themselves, we can see in the mean square displacement that their slope goes over two. But note that in long time scales here, when, the, when I'm looking at the system in a very long time scale, those particles reorient themselves. They don't they are not persistent for a very long time. They also change their propulsion direction randomly, which is out of their control because they are subject to rotational diffusion. This also slope in the long run goes back to, although the amplitude of the, of the mean square displacement, the, the value, amount of the quantity of the mean square displacement is much higher in the, in the scale. You can see that the, the particle that has the velocity of uh, three microns per second is going much further compared to the particle that is not, that doesn't have a velocity. But you can see that the behavior, the slope of the plot converges back to one in longer time scales. So some of you were observing more strongly this part of the plot in the, in the, in the homework, some of you more observing in the, more in the initial part. So it really depends on the time scale 
compared to the time scale of your of your uh, of your rotational diffusion. Is this clear? Any questions about this part? Okay. So we can move forward. So this part, if this part is clear, so this is uh, essentially what people call or define as super diffusion. Super comes from the fact that it's going beyond normal diffusion and mean square displacement values have a, a higher slope than, than a regular mean square displacement that a particle that has no activity, kind of. And uh, we, we can also have a different kind of anomalous diffusion that can be described as subdiffusion. Can anyone guess what subdiffusion in a mean square displacement plot would refer to from the word itself? Any guesses? A hint would be that if a super diffusion is, uh, yes, exactly, Adrian wrote it to the chat now. If a super diffusion have a slope that is greater than one, sub diffusion would be a case where the particle is having a uh, slope that is smaller than one in, the, in this plot, which refers to the cases where particle is obstructed or trapped in kind of certain kind of areas so it's, its mean square displacement cannot go uh, as it should uh, compared to a normal Brownian particle. This is often referred to the cases where the particles get trapped in certain kind of areas. For example, this is an example experiments or a simulation of a particle that is uh, kind of uh, trapped in a, in a potential uh, field landscape. In the beginning, the strength of the forces are very small on the left side, in, you, you see in this, plot A, where the particle is freely moving, essentially. As you increase the amount of force more and more, what will happen is that particle will be uh, trapped in these kind of uh, lower potential uh, energy areas, and it won't be able to get out. If you increase the strength of the potential landscape even more, you will observe that the particle will not be able to move at all at the end and will be trapped in a very limited area. And you can see that as you increase the amounts of average force acting on the particle here from, so that the default line here is the, is the line of the, of the regular diffusion, which uh, corresponds to a case where your slope is one. So you can see actually, have a look at the decades along X and Y, and you will see that this would have a slope one. Whereas if you start increasing the average force on this potential landscape, you're gonna see that the particles mean square displacement will start having kind of a, a subdiffusive, what we, what we call a subdiffusive behavior. So its slope gets under or lower than one in this case. And you can see the, the, the indicator is that the maximum displacement or square displacement a particle can have from, a, from its initial point cannot go beyond a certain value kind of for a long time, which means this is a sign of trapping. So the particles gets trapped somewhere or its motion is somewhat obstructed by, it can be by obstacles, it might be due to boundaries. Think about a particle that is limited in a, in a space with boundaries. It can, in the beginning, the mean square displacement can go linearly, but over a very long time, the particle will reach the boundaries and its square displacement cannot really be larger than the, than the sizes of the, of the environment that the particle is trapped inside. So this is kind of sign of trapping you, we see here, we start to observe. And this is kind of when the motion of the particle, diffusive motion of the particle is obstructed, the, we observe a mean square displacement slope that is smaller than one, which we call subdiffusive behavior. Is this also clear so far? Okay, so we can move forward. So, okay, so let's say we have a trajectory of a particle and we want to understand its characteristics. How do we characterize that? So we want to understand what is, what is this uh, underlying 
diffusion model that is going on. And if the particle is super diffusive or sub diffusive, what is the diffusion exponent in this particle? So one way, of course, is to creating a mean square displacement plot of this, of this uh, trajectory and then trying to see if the slope is greater than one or is equal to one or is smaller than one so that we can characterize it. But also the, uh, there is a lot of different diffusion models that define different motions of uh, a lot of different motions that we observe in nature. For example, here you can see a, a small animation of pol how pollen grains move in water randomly. And here you can see how a red white blood cell is uh, chasing a bacteria in a liquid environment. Or here you can see the motion of uh, uh, proteins at the membrane that are tracked by quantum dots. Here you can see a, a, a sample like uh, trajectories of predators that are looking for prey or food. For example, you can also have a look at the motion of the stock market. The line here in the middle is a sample uh, diffusion model trajectory. It looks actually very similar to the, the motion of the stock market. And you can also track individuals in a, in a big crowd and they will, their motion will uh, look like in the long run, uh, like a diffusion model trajectory. So how are we going to analyze this? I, I want to let you know that uh, it's uh, there has been a challenge, and uh, in the scientific community, this has been a struggle between uh, scientists. And uh, you can see that a lot there are a lot of different diffusion models, and you need to identify which kind of diffusion model class a trajectory belongs to. And we often need to identify if it's super diffusive or if it's sub diffusive, which goes down to the fact that what kind of diffusion exponent these uh, particles have. And so for that, they, uh, we have recently had a challenge that is called Andy Challenge, and the details of the challenge can be found here. I just wanted to mention this because this is kind of a, a very uh, fresh uh, research challenge that we had, and uh, the results were out just a few weeks ago. So you can go and check in this website about the, the details of this challenge but it actually consisted of three different tasks. And the task one is that what is the diffusion exponent, which means what is our kind of slope in a mean square displacement for most of the models. And the other one is that the, how do we classify? And there are different kinds of models that classify the random motion or diffusion, diffusive behavior of different kinds of particles. For example, there is uh, annealed transient time motion, fractional Brownian motion, continuous time random walk, all these different motions define different kind of diffusion of different particles. And then there is the third task of the challenge that is called segmentation. If our diffusion model is changing from one type of behavior to another at a certain time, how can we successfully understand what are the models on the left and right side of this uh, switch and when was the switching time? So all these kinds of things are challenging for, for especially uh, from the perspective of experimental data. Because if we have a theoretical simulation that, uh, or, or data that is, very, that is long enough or rich enough, we have enough data points, we can do a good amount of analysis and find out what kind of model it belongs to, make good fits to it, and try to understand and model right what kind of class it belongs to. And the challenge.org seems to be down for me. Let me see. Uh, on my computer, if you can see my screen, it seems to work. It may be due to they, their website is not very robust from time to time. I don't know why it works for me and not for you. Yeah, it might be. Okay, so you can go and check there the details. And essentially, the, the results actually have been announced and you can see here the results and everything are different themes and different tasks. So, and also the data can be in multiple dimensions. So it, there are different categories. So, all right. Is there any questions up to here? Okay. Okay. 
so we have covered the initial part of active Brownian motion. Now we can uh, now go to experimental realizations and try to see how active particles are experimentally realized. So here, of course, the most natural way that one can think of what are the active particles that we know that naturally exist, they are bacteria. And we can culture bacteria that we know are swimming well, that are characterized. How much difference does multiple? Okay, there is a question about the previous part here. So how much difference does multiple dimensions add is a good question. Is uh, essentially a Brownian motion of a particle is uh, is independent along x y and z right if i am diffusing randomly having a motion along x y and z my equation of motion is independent however it may not be the same think about all these kind of different kind of diffusive models here a a brownian motion of these pollens for example here in this case their motion along x and y will be independent. So it doesn't really matter if I add more di di dimensions to the data or not. Uh, but it will be pretty much different for this uh, white blood cell because its, its motion is, is dependent along x and y. Because whenever it's moving in one direction, it persists to move the same direction for a while along x and along y. So if I plot the x and y independently, I will see displacements that are that are correlated. It's the, the same thing applies for predators that look for prey. They go in one direction for a while, stop, look for food a little bit there, and then go in another direction. And when they go in a straight line, kind of, they displace the same amount in X and Y for a while. So this kind of gets correlated. And this is sometimes easy to realize if you analyze the data, if you don't have any measurement noise in the par particle position. However, if you have measurement noise, this also gets, this correlation might get a little bit more difficult to see, therefore difficult to classify what kind of, if it's an active Brownian motion or not. Does that answer your question? Adrian, okay, great. So we can move on to the experimental part, okay. So how can we realize this active Brownian motion in the experimental environment? So we can collect data and, uh, and analyze them and do statistics about it. The most natural and obvious way that we know that our good swimmers are E. coli bacteria. We can culture them. There are biologists that know th that have been doing this for, for decades. Uh, then they have been optimized all these conditions. What we can do is we can culture this kind of bacteria and put them in an environment where they actually uh, swim continuously and there are also other kind of bacteria that different genetics that have uh, uh, different kind of swimming behavior here you see this actually this very similar type of bacteria but they have a different kind of motion that is classified as run and tumble motion so here you see that uh, the particles are going the bacteria are going along a straight line kind of for a while and then they stop they kind of uh, 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 untumble the, the, the flagella and then they kind of let them diffuse around randomly a little bit and then they push themselves in another random direction while they start uh, activating their flagella while they, are, they kind of reoriented randomly and then they tumble again in a different direction. So, of course, you see that the diffusion model that is uh, uh, representing the bacteria along the left uh, on the left video and on the right video don't have to be the same because here they are defined as smooth swimmers which refers to the fact that they're swimming continuously here they are described as run and tumble swimmers which refers to the fact that they kind of once in a while stop their motion change their direction go to another direction and move along that line whereas these bacteria have a kind of continuous uh, swimming along with a continuous reorientation coming from the rotational diffusion. And also there are <clears throat> other type of uh, micro swimmers which we can create artificially. So in a liquid environment, we can create particles. What, what defines uh, 
as an active particle. An active particle is a particle that is diffusing in a liquid environment, but has also the ability to propel itself. So it needs to be able to apply a force on itself so it can propel in, a, in one direction in a liquid environment. And one way to create this is that people have uh, the, the first idea that people had is that creating asymmetric particles and uh, thermally uh, stimulate them to move in one direction. So this is one experimental realization that was one of the first ones that they kind of coated a microscopic particle half of it uh, with, with gold. This created an asymmetry around the particle, especially if you shine a laser field that have a, a green, uh, green laser light that is uh, absorbed strongly by the gold part of the particle. In this case, this creates an asymmetric temperature field around the particle. This creates the asymmetry and the thermophoretic forces that push the particle along one direction. And another method is that, uh, so, th so you see that this, this method is, uh, is, is good and it works, but the problem here is that, uh, the, the one here is that the thermophoretic forces are, are not very strong. So the particle's motion is rather slow. Here, there is another model that pe people have developed. This is a catalytic, catalytic swimmer, what people call. So they make a, also a particle that has uh, an asymmetric coating. One side is coated with gold that is not reacting to the surrounding liquid. The other side is uh, coated with platinum that actually uh, uh, reacts to hydrogen peroxide very strongly, chemically reacts to it. And this results in, in, uh, in a strong reaction. If you, if you expose these particles in an environment with hydrogen peroxide, so the, this is catalytic and it's the reaction is very strong. This works kind of like a rocket and the particle is propelling itself constantly and it, it can have higher uh, propulsion velocities. But the disadvantage, this is not biocompatible because hydrogen peroxide is an, not a biocompatible chemical compound. Another example that people can, can have is uh, attaching or connecting a uh, magnetic uh, tail to a microscopic particle and mimicking kind of the flagellal motion of the of the bacteria. You can see here is that people can attach kind of uh, a something magnetic at the at the at the edge of a spherical particle, making making it look like a bacteria, and then externally drive this kind of magnetic tail with a with a with a modulating external mag magnetic field. And the particle will start kind of propelling itself in, in one direction. You can see that this is not the, uh, uh, like the intuitional movement direction, but particle is like rotating like this, but it's actually pulling itself in one direction. Another example can be that, uh, okay, there is a question. Would the particle not align with the magnetic field? It depends on the particle type. Here we have uh, the, the, the most often the particles are silica particles that are not magnetic at all. They don't have any magnetic properties unless they are coated with something else. Here, uh, the, the tail of the particle is magnetic that they can control and align with the field, but the head is not magnetic. Of course, you can also have a, have a different design, microscopic design of, a, of the particle that is uh, 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 head can also be magnetic, but in this particular case, head is not magnetic. It's only the tail that is magnetic. So would you need some sort of stochastic magnetic field to get Brownian motion? Here, the purpose is more to get active Brownian motion than the Brownian motion, because Brownian motion, we get it anyway inside the liquid environment. And for a lot of purposes, create activity in a liquid environment, the purpose is to control the particle motion, is not to randomize it most often. For example, these possible applications are drug delivery and other kind of microscopic applications. So you, the, the idea is more always experimental purposes are more focused around 
controlling the particle motion rather than randomizing it. So people don't really have always the purpose to create a Brownian motion, which already exists. Here you can see another example of this uh, hydrogen peroxide I have shown you. And here you can see a very tiny microscopic particle that is almost difficult to see. You, you can see that it's propelling itself rather fast compared to its size over time. Uh, this, of course, one limit for this system, as you can see, is that hydrogen peroxide is kind of working here like a liquid. And as the particle is interacting with the environment, it's creating a gas. So there will be bubbles coming out of the liquid in the long run, and it will, it will eventually turn into water. And if there are no hydrogen peroxide left in the liquid, it will stop working. And there is lately another uh, kind of advancement in, uh, in these kind of particles. These, by the way, are called, most often referred as Janus particles. And they can be put in a, pretty much like the case of uh, the original Janus particles that worked with thermophoretic forces. This one is subject, uh, this one is uh, immersed in an environment where there is a liquid uh, mixture, which is water and lutein that this mixture has a very specific feature that it's, uh, they are dissolved, the compounds are dissolved between each other above certain temperature, and they are kind of demixing below a certain temperature. What will happen is that if you keep the solution in a, at a temperature that is very close to this critical point, a small heat can create a huge uh, fluctuation in the liquid that would create a large, much larger amount of forces compared to the case of thermal forces. So in this case, what will happen is that when you shine light on this particle, green light, the gold coated half of this particle will heat up. This heat will create a higher temperature around this part of the particle, around this half of the particle. And this will create, since it's already very close to a phase separation temperature, it will start demixing here, water and lutein, where it's dissolved between other places. This will create a very strong asymmetry, much stronger compared to this, this original Janus particle. And it will create a strong propulsion force along one direction. And this will also create active motion. And these are some sample example ways you can go and check. I, when I upload this presentation to the lecture folder, you can go and check all these different kinds of also other kind of uh, artificial micro swimmer models and how they are realized experimentally on these reference links here. Are there any questions so far? Okay, if there are no questions so far, we can take a break now, 15 minute break, and then uh, we can continue at 11. All right, let's proceed. Let's see. Share the screen. Can someone in the chat confirm that you can see my screen and hear me? Yes, okay. So in the, in the last lecture, we, were, we have been seeing all these kind of artificial micro swimmers that can propel themselves. And uh, we can ask the question, how can we have uh, uh, artificial swimmers that are not only uh, active, but also they are chiral active particles. So that, that kind of have a chirality that can go along a kind of helical trajectories instead of a linear one. So they have kind of a tendency. The, the important thing with chiral activity is that there's, there are lots of chiral molecules in nature and it's very, it's, it's, it may be very important to sort them. So that's why people are trying to model all this kind of chiral activity as well. So it's not only a metaphorical curiosity, it's also important for understanding the natural chiral active particles and their motion behavior. And uh, the, the, the approach is very similar to those ones that were having a, a continuous uh, active motion. In this case, 
where they have a kind of asymmetric particles that are L-shaped and uh, the asymmetry direction of the particles will determine if the particle is going to be left or right chiral particles. So you see in this kind of, uh, in, the, in, the, in the first case that is shown in A, the particle has a yeah, reverse L shape and they only coat with gold in the bottom part of the particle that is here. So when we shine light on it, this part of the particle is uh, getting heater than the rest, which results in a propulsion in this forward direction. So it goes in this direction, propels itself. However, what happens in reality is that since the particle is asymmetric and there is a, the propulsion along this direction, there is a torque acting on the particle. So this results in the change of the direction of the particle over time. And this results in a, in a propulsion that is going in this kind of helical trajectories. And what happens, what, I, what do I need to change the direction of this uh, rotation? Simply just uh, reverting the asymmetry of the particle. If I make a particle that is asymmetric in the opposite way, it will have a chiral motion that have the opposite chirality. Okay, so now we have seen some simple characteristics of active Brownian motion and uh, some kind of experimental realizations. We can have a look at uh, some properties and why are they important and uh, why we study them. One of the important things with active Brownian particles is that they uh, are breaking down equilibrium physics or equilibrium statistical physics that we know. And most of the rules that we know from equilibrium physics don't really apply to the case of active particles. And why do normal, why does the standard equilibrium physics law apply to the Brownian particles? Because the, the surrounding, surrounding liquid environment for these Brownian particles act as a thermal bath. Example we can give here is the, is the first case. Assume that we have a particle, Brownian particle that is uh, immersed in an environment where we have a harmonic potential energy. So the particle has a kind of recalling force up uh, back to a certain direction along one direction. So in this case, the minimum energy point is where X is equal to zero. And if the particle is displaced from this position, it will be uh, uh, subject to a force that is pushing the particle back to its original position. Depending on the displacement of the, of the particle, the force recalling force will be larger. And if we simulate a Brownian particle with no activity, just diffusion, we will see that its motion will be uh, confined within this trap. So it won't be able to go so far away because of these recalling forces coming from our trapping potential. And we can have a look at this uh, distribution of the particle. And we will see that this distribution can be uh, predicted by Boltzmann distribution formula uh, with, with, with uh, uh, different states of a system with different potential energies. And you can repeat this with the many different, so this is a potential, you can see that this is a quartic potential, the potential energy value is changing by the fourth power of the position. And you can see that the car particle characteristics in the trajectory is a little bit different, but the final distribution will be, we can be exactly distributed uh, as the Boltzmann distribution predicts. And here you can see another case where the, the particle is trapped in a kind of a double well. In this case, the trajectory will look like this. It will be trapped for a while in one well, and it will, once in a while, it will have enough diffusion strength to jump from one well to the other, and it will diffuse there for a while, and it will jump back and forth. This is a famous phenomenon that is referred in the literature as Kramer's transitions. So you, if you see the distribution, position distribution of the, of the particle, this is actually proportional to the uh, inverse exponential of the, of the initial potential energy. So this is a very important uh, uh, test to see if equilibrium statistics work for a, for a Brownian particle. We can also realize this kind of uh, uh, potential. So all these potentials and results I'm showing you are numerical results. I just assume a hypothetical potential that is uh, 
a harmonic potential along uh, around a certain equilibrium point and then create and simulate a trajectory. But is there a possible way to verify this experimentally? The answer is yes. And how we do it is the following. So we can have a, so this technique is called optical tweezers. If those, uh, if some of you may have heard of it, it's probably because it received a Nobel prize uh, two years back in physics. So what we can do is if we have a microscopic particle inside the liquid environment and we are focusing a laser beam on this particle, what will happen is that these laser beams go through the particle and then let's assume the particle initially stands in the very center of this laser beam. All the beams, since they are going exactly inside with 90 degrees, it will go without refraction and they will get out from the particle. And uh, this right side is just to keep, let's say we have another objective that is collecting the beam. So this is what we have. If we have a microscopic particle at, at the precise focal point of a laser beam. But if we let this particle diffuse around, the particle will start refracting the light beams. And this is, of course, a can be a lecture in itself, but I just want to, here to highlight the, the technique, experimental technique, but I will not go into details of the theoretical details of how this trapping is made. But this is a decades of developing research and people can trap microscopic particles this way. And you can see that here is a simulated force field of the particle. Uh, the, the, the black arrow is acting, the force acting on the particle depending its position. And you're going to realize that if the particle is going in the this direction compared to its equilibrium point, it will optically be forced back to for its own original position. And the opposite the will happen if we, the particle is displaced in the other direction, it will be pulled uh, back to this direction. And it, the exact equilibrium position will be slightly to the right of the focal point, simply because some of the laser is scattered back. And this is due to the fact that the, the light has momentum. And when the, the light hits the particle and gets refracted, it, it kind of changes its momentum. And this results in an acting force on the, on the microscopic particle. And uh, if you have a questions, we can can discuss in detail more about this, uh, but it may take a it may take a lecture in itself. But I just want to highlight here that with using lasers, we can trap and manipulate microscopic particles in liquid environments, and this is a widely used technique and very uh, like uh, it has been standardized in a way that, for example, here you see that I have programmed a microscopic particle to go along a a trajectory that I predefined in the computer. What I do is I am moving my laser beam along a point that is kind of drawing an infinity sign and the particle is kind of following that laser beam, which you don't see the laser here because it's filtered out in the optical, optical with an optical filter. Because the laser beam is strong, then I wouldn't be able to see the particle. You can see that when I'm moving the laser beam, the particle has to follow the laser. So we can actually create traps and manipulate particles and trapping potentials with, with lasers expo, ex, experiment. And this can apply to so many different systems, depending on your system. Of course, if you, are, if you want to trap atoms, single atoms, you cannot do it in a, in a liquid environment. You need to create a very high vacuum advanced environment, but it's possible to trap single atoms with laser beams. It's possible to trap quantum dots. It's possible to trap biomolecules, cells, bacteria, algae or all these kind of uh, artificial uh, microscopic particles as well. Or it can also be lipid droplets. It can be anything you can think of that has a higher refractive index than the one of water inside the liquid environment. So this technique is widely used to study experimentally the properties of microscopic particles and how they behave. So, and then once we have the particle trapped uh, optically, so with a laser beam, what we can do is we can uh, create the image, get the image from the microscope, threshold the image, and find the center of mass of this thresholded image. And we can identify the location of the particle. And we can do it for many different frames. And we get the, this is, you see here, an optically trapped particle moving around uh, inside, a, inside a trap under a harmonic potential. And you can see its trajectory. So it's recorded over time. 
one thing you have you you can notice here is that this trajectory this is an experimentally obtained trajectory looks very similar to the original trajectory i showed you here trajectory of a particle that is in a in a show of course then once i have obtained this trajectory i can check that uh, if this uh, potential is uh, verified if this potential that is trapping my particle is harmonic if it's harmonic it should be following my boltzmann distribution rule that i was showing you in the beginning so i check the uh, logarithm of particle displacement versus uh, the the position and i see the the measured points from the experimentally measured trajectory points the distribution of the probability of the particle is uh, fitting precisely to the distribution of the of the of the Boltzmann that is predicted by this formula here you notice that the probability distribution here is plotted in logarithmic scale it is actually identical to this distribution that i'm showing here something that looks like a Boltzmann distribution or gaussian distribution looks like this on a on a linear scale when the y axis p of x is linear looks like this in the in the logarithmic scale it looks like a parabola in the logarithmic scale so it's only the different definition of the y axis here that is the log so here we can actually experimentally verify that uh, these particles actually uh, follow Boltzmann statistics if they don't have any activity good however what we want to show next is that when we have active particles these equilibrium statistics kind of break so we are no longer able to observe the same kind of behavior for example let's say this is these are some simulation results that is from a from a nice article about this and you can you can see the link here i think this one is the additional reading folder of the of the lecture uh, lecture folder lecture 7 folder so when the particles have no activity that you can see in this panel A is that they can go with diffusion along everywhere in this limited area of a circle. So they can go to the boundaries, they can come back, but they have solid boundaries, not periodic boundary conditions. But I want to say that it wouldn't change anything if they had periodic boundary conditions for this case. So that you see that the probability distribution of these particles is flat because there is no there is no forces acting on the particles so it's the potential energy is flat so the probability should not change from one place to the other however but as soon as the particles start being active you realize that what happens is that they get they swim along a certain direction until they hit a wall and then they tend to kind of try to swim against the wall which they fail to do and eventually they end up spending more time at the boundaries and as the activity increases on the panel C, you see that they, they swim much faster and reach quickly to the wall and kind of for a while try to swim against the wall. And even if they change direction, they go again another direction and hit again the wall quickly and then spend a lot of time at the boundaries. So of course, the distribution of, the, of these particles, the probability distributions that at the time, if you look at a particle where they can be, we will observe them much more often to be found at the boundaries than in the bulk or in the center. So in this case, this shows us obviously a strong difference if we compare it to the case that is on the left panel, that is the A. Here, they don't have any velocity and the probability distribution is following the, what we can uh, predict from equilibrium statistics, Boltzmann equilibrium statistics. However, here you see that the distributions of particles are, are they tend to be much more, uh, uh, at the boundaries rather than at the bulk. And you can kind of uh, do a similar research. These are the probability distributions of particles with uh, different velocities of a, in, a, in a harmonic trap. And then you can see that if the particle velocity is very high, they tend to kind of have a double peak because once they try to go in one direction, they kind of get in uh, stuck in the one edge of the trap and if they try to go in the other direction they get tend to get stuck in the other edge of the trap a similar behavior is uh, is observed in, in this kind of a setting with simulations is that uh, whenever a browning particle has a potential barrier uh, in its uh, configuration space that has a certain amount of uh, potential height but the barrier is asymmetric 
which means that if the particles approaches the barrier on one side, the force acting on it will be smaller, but it will act on it on a longer distance. Whereas on the other side, the force acting on it, the particle is trying to reach over to the other side of the barrier. The force acting on it will be larger, but it will act on a, on a shorter distance. So for a normal Brownian particle that is only diffusive, the difficulty for the particle to pass to the right side from the left side and the opposite will be exactly the same. So the particle will be equally likely to go jump from one side of the valve or of the, of the space to the other over the, over the barrier or from right to the left, the probabilities would, would not be changing. What does R represent? It can't be, it's allowed to be negative. Where are you referring to, Matthias? Which plot? Aha, uh -huh, okay. I think here uh, it uh, there is a typo in the figure of the article that this R should be uh, kind of, uh, when you take the cross section kind of the figure. So actually R, Minus R represents the other end of the, of the, I don't really exactly remember how this calculation was made, but it means that, so that if uh, R is 20, it means that it's on one edge. If I, R is minus 20, it means that it's on the other edge, kind of. So it's kind of also related to the phi, if that makes sense. I understand your complaint because uh, R in principle can only be positive here for representation purposes. If that say the phi is uh, between zero and pi, it is positive, the R they assumed. If it's pi and between pi and two pi, it assumed to be minus values, just for representation purposes. But you are right, normally if it was the absolute value of the distance to the center, it would only have to have a, have a positive value. And here, the, the situation is actually different if you have an active particle. If you have a swimmer, it, may, it might be much more easier for a particle to jump from one side to the other than the other way around because uh, the force acting on the particle is smaller even if it's acting on a longer distance and particle may be able to climb much easier on one direction than the other. Also, another uh, example is that when you have a kind of uh, uh, asymmetric obstacle, this can also result in trapping really active particles strongly. In this case, you have kind of uh, active kind of swimming uh, microscopic rods. This is also a numerical study. And you see that uh, when you have an obstacle that is uh, bracket shaped, and if the angle is very small, the swimmers that are rod shaped might get in to the, to the bracket and swim all the way to the edge like the corner of it and then kind of get trapped here because they cannot really turn back and kind of there are more and more swimmers over time that get in and trap here and then uh, they can't really get out here depending on the angle of this bracket you can see here is that if the angle is very large they can just keep swimming and going out from the other side there will there will be no trapping and if the angle is uh, uh, very small, what will happen is that they will all be trapped actually in here, but there is just no space to fit more particles in so that some of the particles will be left outside, but with a different kind of uh, bracket angle of the obstacle, all particles can actually get trapped inside this area. So depending on, however, always think about what would have happened if my particles were not active, were not propelling the, themselves. The thing would happen is that uh, they would only diffuse. So they are equally likely to go in one direction than the other, and their motion is not really correlated. It, it would mean that they would have a uniform distribution at all times, no matter what kind of shape my obstacle has, no matter what kind of boundaries I have, or no matter what kind of landscape I have. They would always have the distribution, if the potential is higher, of course, at some point, places, for example, if I had a diffusive particle here instead of an active particle, it will be less likely to be found on top of this obstacle, which is understandable because it's also predicted and uh, 
uh, analyzed by Boltzmann's law. So it is uh, that we, we understand, but it would never happen in a way that the probability of the particle to be found on the left side and the right side would not be, it would always be equal for a passive particle. Is this clear so far? Yes. And then now we can go into the case. You remember when I showed you the case of the passive particle, when we trap it the particle and get the trajectory, and we see that it is its distribution actually follows the, the Boltzmann distribution, and we can verify this experimentally. We can ask the question, what happens if I put the same particle in an environment where there are swimming bacteria around? You see that this is a sample video of a microscopic particle that is uh, made of kind of silica it's a very tiny particle that has two micron radius and it's kind of diffusing around freely but importantly once in a while the particle is pushed by a bacteria in a certain direction so instead of uh, only having the thermal noise it will also have what we call active noise that is the forces coming from the bacteria that push the particle around these forces are correlated over time unlike the thermal noise the random walk part of the particle's motion so the resulting motion of this particle, this is an experimental trajectory you see is the uh, orange trajectory here, is the trajectory of this particle in this bacteria sample. And you can see the blue one here for comparison, it's the same particle uh, diffusing freely in a liquid where there are no bacteria. You see that the motion of the particle is largely enhanced and important. They, you see that the particle's motion has a, uh, pretty persistent parts here, but it's going pretty much for, uh, persistently in, in one direction for a, for a while. This is when actually, this is a time when the particle gets pushed by a bacteria uh, in, a, in a certain direction for a while. And what we see here is that mean square displacement of the particle. So the passive particle uh, that, uh, is referred with this blue trajectory here. The trajectory of the same particle in, a, in, a, in an environment where there are no bacteria. If I check the mean square displacement of this particle, its slope is exactly one. So it's a regular diffusion. The particle is only moving due to the collision speed from the water molecules. And you see that the dashed, black, dashed uh, blue line here is the, a line drawn by the, for the comparison to the slope one. So this is following exactly the same as the regular diffusion formula. However, when I have a particle in an active environment where there are lots of swimming bacteria, its mean square displacement is, uh, its slope is greater than one for shorter time scales. It's simply because in shorter time scales, particle has this kind of persistent motion in its trajectory where it's, when it gets pushed by a bacteria and this, creates a persistent time scale that is short for the particle. But if you look at the mean square displacement in a very longer time, uh, you will see that its slope converges back to one, which is this red dashed line. Uh, this is because even though the particle gets pushed around for a while, which creates a persistent motion for, for the particle for a, a short while, it will that bacteria will pass by and go away and another bacteria will come and push in another direction. So it will renormalize in the long run, although it is moving in terms of absolute values much higher in terms of quantities, much more than the passive particle, but it will, its trend in uh, the speed of changing its mean square displacement will again be linear. So we can say that this particle's motion in short time scales is super diffusive. We are referring to the parts of the regime that is uh, referring to a time scale that is kind of between uh, smaller than 10 seconds. But if my time scales, I'm talking about time scales that are larger than this, you will observe that uh, the particle's motion will effectively be uh, uh, super diffuse. Does this make sense? Are there any questions related to this part? Okay, what we can do now is that we, we can show that no matter how much uh, Assume that I have a passive particle now, and I trap the particle uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a laser potential that I was showing you before at different length scales. 
I, I observe that the particles distribution, someone commented, finally understand the MST plot in homework three, thanks. Okay, I'm happy that someone finally understood it. Good. Okay, so now we are looking at the distribution of the particle. Note that this distribution is plotted logarithmically scaled. So it would, if it was plotted linearly scaled, it would look uh, very much like this distribution I was showing you, this G. So distribution of, a, it's, it would be a Gaussian distribution. A Gaussian distribution that looks like this on a linear plot, looks like this in a, when it's plotted logarithmically, just so you know. Why do we plot it like this? Because it's much more easier to understand if it's deviating from a Gaussian distribution. Okay, and then what I do is I increase the strength of the trap. You see that, notice that the scale of x-axis is changing significantly. I am increasing the power of the trap and the, trapping the particle into smaller and smaller regions. You see here the particle is confined in a much smaller environment. What we observe is that the distribution quality doesn't change if I increase the trapping power for a passive particle inside an optical trap. The same is not true for, for an active particle. Instead, you see that I put the same particle that was the same trap here. You see the length scales are the same in an active uh, environment. So I create the same optical trap in an environment where the particle is immersed uh, in a liquid with bacteria. Its distribution is largely enhanced. But we observe that since this length scale of this trap is uh, much larger than the average, uh, let's say this is called, this, this scale here, orange bar is called persistence length, which means that uh, if I have, if I can tell you without getting into mathematical details, it's kind of an average distance that the particle gets pushed by a bacteria. So if this, if my trapping potential is much larger than this, what happens is that it kind of equilibrates at an effective temperature, kind of, because of the existence of the bacteria. However, as soon as I trap the particle in a smaller and smaller length scale, especially when the length scales get, get, gets comparable to the, to the persistence length, which is the uh, pushing length of the bacteria, of the particle, and my distribution deviates from the, from the one of Gaussian that I was always observing in the, in the thermal equilibrium case, where there were no activity in the medium. So you, we observe here that even if our original microscopic particle is not active by itself, it can show non-equilibrium properties in an environment due to, the, due to the activity that is surrounding the particle. In, in this case, it's the bacteria. Is there any questions about this part? No, okay. In this case, we proceed to the fourth part of this lecture, which is pretty straightforward because uh, uh, it was essentially very closely co uh, connected to your homework. So these active kind of particles uh, can, uh, can create this kind of collective behavior and create clustering. And this was a groundbreaking research at the time. It's uh, a few years back, you can see seven years ago, Halachi and others observed this kind of behaviors. They created genus particles and they were swimming in a liquid environment. They observed this kind of clustering behavior. And this was a huge impact to research and everybody tried to understand after this, how this happened, how can we explain this kind of clustering behavior? And you can see that uh, it can happen on different kinds of uh, uh, experiments and it could also be reproduced by other people. And he, in here is, uh, a kind of uh, environment where the particle also have an attractive force between each other. So they kind of, when they get the cluster, they stick together. And uh, it has also been verified in other research in numerical studies. And also one of, the, one of the simulations that is made about this one is the particles with aligning, aligning interaction. That is your homework too. So what would happen is that here, the, they would observe that the lifetime of each cluster depends uh, significantly on the amount of rotational diffusion on the particle. So this is uh, the reference uh, to the, the main reference of the homework three file actually. And this is the results that were uh, 
originally created. So you can also kind of see similar behavior in your own homework uh, uh, results, ideally, if you've done everything right. Or you can also run uh, my files that I, I will upload today after, and you can try to see this kind of behavior that particles are clustered. So this is one way to explain why the particles would, would uh, uh, cluster together. Is there any questions about this part? Okay, then we continue in sorting of, of these active particles and filtering of them. It is very important to understand how to sort and uh, 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 filter these kind of active particles depending on their activity properties because there is a lot of biological uh, uh, agents that we want to actually uh, uh, purify. So if, let's say if we want to make experiments on certain kind of bacteria, we want to split them from another kind. So we can do some kind of filtering or sorting mechanism depending on their activity. So it is very useful if we can sort uh, active particles according to their uh, swimming velocity or swimming orientation, uh, like their chirality or their their overall activity level so here we, i will show you a few experimental techniques that people have successfully made to sort these kind of active particles so one way is this one is called uh, asymmetric brackets so people make kind of two different compartments so on the left compartment you have a environment and then on the right compartment you have another environment and the only way you can switch from one environment to the other is the gap between these brackets that you see here in panel A. So what happens is that if a swimmer is approaching from the left side to the right, it's most often hit this edge of the bracket and it will most often swim over to this side and it will be able to pass to the other side. However, due to asymmetry, if a particle comes from the other direction, it will it will end up in this edge, which is inside of the bracket, and it will either go into this corner or come back, and it will swim back. It won't be able to easily turn back, especially if a swimmer is a smooth swimmer running uh, in the in a, in a, in one direction for a while. It won't be able to manage to pass to the to, to the other side. And you can see here that this is an experiment done with the bacteria. And you can see that most of the bacteria are homogeneously distributed in the beginning of the experiment. They put uh, liquid and bacteria in both sides of the, this kind of microscopic environment. And at the end of the experiment, you observe that the most of the bacteria are trapped on one side than the other. So this is one way and most straightforward way, kind of getting a bracketing kind of trap to, to, to trap particles. Another way to, to sort them is, uh, using these asymmetric kind of barriers. So let's say I have a barrier that is physically made in a liquid environment. That is, the my sample is getting higher, but the barrier is asymmetric. So it's uh, if I engineer it in a very fine way that a bacteria can swim, so the, the force they, they generate on themselves is good enough to swim from the from this side to the other side, but it's not enough to swim from this side to this side. You can think about this model as if you have a car that, is, that has a weak engine. So if you have a lower steepness, you can come from this side and apply full power and then be able to pass to the other side. But if you have a car with a weak engine and you have a very high steepness, you may not be able to propel your, yourself along this steepness even though overall the energy you need to spend theoretically is the same along both directions, it may be for a car or for an active particle to be able to pass from one side to the other easier than the other. So here you see that uh, they can design these kind of asymmetric traps in, in two dimensions. And depending on the shape of this barrier, that you, can, you can design things in a way that you collect the, the bacteria. So uh, in the example here, for example, well, you see that uh, the bacteria were initially more in the center and then at the end, so 
sorry, this is the end of the experiment pictures. So they de designed different kind of structures. The ones that are in this diagonal are supposed to be pushing away the bacteria from the structure. So if you want to create an environment that is bacteria free, this will be the right choice to do. And if you have the, if you want to collect the bacteria together in, in, in a certain region, you can use the opposite kind of asymmetry in your barrier. There is one question, is the first example related to how cells pump certain substances through cell membrane to undo the equilibrium created by osmosis? Or is this only for larger living cells? Okay, so the, the, the filtering mechanism that the cells have uh, is, uh, I would say, much more complicated than this. They have this kind of, for example, in, uh, in cells, they have this kind of sodium channels. I am no, I'm no biologist, so probably there are a few students that can answer this much better than how I do, but it's mostly there. Uh, the, so this, how can I explain this? Okay, the explanation is simple. So here we create this structure and we don't spend any energy anymore. It's autonomous. It's uh, getting the energy from the activity of the swimmers themselves. So these structures don't spend energy to put particles from one side to the other. Is that correct? I just create this and they move from one side to the other due to their activity. But cells actually do need to spend chemical energy to transfer materials inside or outside of the cell if they want to fight against osmosis or something. So it's kind of a different uh, structure. Yeah, exactly. The difference is that we don't spend energy in any of these kind of sorting mechanism. We create an environment that sorts these kind of active particles automatically. And we can also uh, make a similar kind of, uh, uh, so here we kind of, in the, in the previous cases, we only had one type of swimmer that is swimming at the, with the same characteristics. What happens if we have particles that are passive and particles that are active, or even different kind of activity? We can create this kind of, uh, uh, let's say, patterned environments that there is the gravity here to the down. So this is two dimensional, but you can think of it at, as X, Z. So this axis is actually where there is the gravity. So the particles are by default pushed down. And if the particle is passive, what will happen is that it will, due to this structured, like smartly structured obstacles, it will more or less go down from where it starts. However, an active particle will mostly swim along these kind of obstacles and it will mostly go along one direction that is favored by the, by the design of the structure. And if the particle is, has even more activity, it may go even more along, along the close to a horizontal line. So this is one way of uh, characterizing particles due, uh, depending on their activity. So you, you, different particles with different activity will propagate in this kind of environment in different directions. Another way is that you can, you can uh, sort the, the active particles due to their chirality by creating this kind of smart obstacles. While in this case, you see that if a particle has uh, left chirality, it will be much more stable for the particles or much more difficult for the particle. If it's automatically rotating left while it's swimming, it will be much more difficult for that particle to get out of this one. While it, if it has right chirality, like this way, it will be very easy because it's swimming in this direction and it can easily get out of this trap. The same is true for the opposite chirality. So if you run this simulation for long enough, the quality maybe is not good, but you see some kind of red and uh, uh, black particles here that are right and left chiral particles. And you observe that the ones with the left chirality will at the end mostly trap on the left one and the opposite ones will mostly trap on the right one. So this is another mechanism that you can trap active chiral active particles. And you can see the, how chirality works in the particle that's really going around here. This is a left chiral particle kind of. Okay, so in conclusion, we have seen all these kind of different uh, 
motions and types. So we, we started with what is activity Brownian motion, and we talked a little bit about anomalous diffusion, what we mean square displacement means, and how it should be interpreted depending on the slope against when it plotted against against time. And we have seen how this can experimentally be realized depending on what kind of behavior we want to observe. And we have talked about these active motions most often break uh, the standard equilibrium statistic laws, the, the laws of statistical physics that we know. And then we have seen some kind of collective behaviors very similar to the homework three that we, you have done. And then we have seen some techniques, experimental techniques, mostly uh, used by scientists to sort or filter these kind of active particles. So this was all I have uh, planned to say. If you have any questions, you can ask. Otherwise, uh, these are all the things that I wanted to say. Are there any questions? Hi, can you hear yes. me? Yes. So I thought this was very fun to look at. But uh, I have a question about simulations in general. Uh, yes. So for example, in homework three, we used periodic boundary conditions to, yes. I guess, uh, more realistically approximate uh, interactions from particles uh, far away. Uh, but okay, uh, the periodic boundary conditions for active particles, especially if you want to create, if you want to mimic an environment that is very large, so if you have an environment that is very large, particle won't really get stuck at the boundaries, right? Yeah because the environment is large. But if you want to make a simulation with a very limited area, if you have solid boundary conditions, the disadvantage is that they will most often quickly swim to the boundary and get stuck there. Exactly. So that's why we use more, more often the periodic one, for example, like in the case of homework three. Okay, so my question is, uh, when we are uh, designing our problem for the uh, project, for example, Yes. Um, if we are considering an uh, environment with interacting agents, how can we determine whether or not it's suitable to use periodic boundary conditions for the problem we are choosing to study? I would say uh, you think about uh, it really depends on the specific problem. You can also discuss with this with your friends, with your even or with your tutor that uh, I think if you think about the real specific condition you have in your project and what would create more realistic outcome you can you, you can come up with something i think because so in our project we are looking at uh, stores competing for profits in a city um, okay. and each store tries to optimize their position relative to the other stores uh, to increase their profits um, and for me it's intuitive to say that we would want periodic boundary conditions to uh, sort of uh, limit the size of the simulations while still being able to assume that the city would be large. But at the same time, um, using periodic boundary conditions makes like the results of the simu simulation very trivial and less interesting. So I'm okay. a bit conflicted because my intuition tells me I would want to use uh, I see. The I periodic would say boundaries, but the results I, indicate it. Yeah, may I see. I would say there is there is a lot of other ways you can inf in, in, you can also include new parameters to the simulation to to make it more complicated. However, you can also show what happens in both cases if it's interesting to see uh, both of the conditions. Good point. But I would say if it's too trivial with uh, boundary conditions that are uh, periodic, maybe you can think about some new parameters to introduce in the problem to make it a little bit more complicated or exciting. Right. Okay. Thank you. Is there any more questions? Okay. Uh, you can always leave questions in the canvas. Uh, okay. Then uh, see you all on Thursday for the homework four. Thank you very much. So uh, I will stop recording. Thank you, the lecture is over.